I'm Cerecita Blanco the Ice Sister and we're reading Saru Nastra Karina. This is lesson one on sleepers. Uh, part one. It was a rainy afternoon during Karina's first day of school. She had no real opinion about it. She did have plenty of memory fragments on the on the matter, but she decided not to look them up. She did not want to pollute her first inflation of the place. At the moment, she was in my dude's residence. It seemed to her a lot easier than to rent a flat in another part of the city. Her bedroom was quite massive, but the size of it was not noticeable from the exterior of the apartment. The only, the only, the only one on the job was a kitty cat who had climbed to her open window. The cat belonged to the downstairs neighbor, and it was always in the habit of getting into everyone else's apartment. In Karina's world, the the typing. The type of cat that was looking through her window was known as Burmese. It had a slender long body and a wedge shaped heart and a wedge shaped head, large pointed ears and green almond eyes. The almond eyes. The cat eyed her bedroom with curiosity. Still it did not enter because the roses in the balcony were barring his entrance. The balcony was rather small and it had iron ornamental railings. Karina had used the balcony to fill it with as many flowers as she could. Her room was large enough to fit a king size bed. It was wide enough for her to stretch both her arms and legs. The room had a little library with some of her favorite books. Like her mother, she adored picture books and she would collect them from the locals, from any of the locals that sold them. Facing the bed there was a full body mirror. The edges of the mirror were mosaics made of necklace. The necklace came from different colored oysters. The pattern of the mirror was abstract, mimicking the ebb and flow of the wave. The mirror reflected the bed and the tapestry behind the bed. The tapestry was a replica of work that was millions of years old. It featured a maiden outside her tent wearing a red dress. Beside her was a lady in waiting, also in red. A lady in waiting in red? <laughs> a lady in waiting in red. <laughs> the servant was offering to the lady a coffee with jewel. Holding the tent open was a poor rendition of a, uni of a lion and a unicorn. There was also some flats and decorated trees, in addition to the golden patterns against the red background. Beside the large mirror, there was a vanity she never used, in addition to the cushion chair and the empty boxes. Junior eyes had her open and they would see only false items. They were designed to give the illusion that a normal person lived there. Karina liked her siblings, she summoned her attires. The only real items the visitors could examine was her library. Aside from, the from this furniture, Karina had two sofas facing a small round table. In the center there was an ornamental golden and bronze baroque clock. The interior of the clock had the painted image of a cake as seen through a kaleidoscope. Time? 11 minutes. The room itself had an analogous red and golden color scheme. The color said to highlight the natural beauty of the indoor succulents. Karina had a couple in key locations or in key locations and of different sizes. Near the pair of, the, near the pair of windows surrounding the balcony, she had two ivory tables with a large closet of per Perescia aculeta succulents. Those are those little cactus. Mm. At the moment they had exquisite round orange fruit. When now with fruit they had flowers with white petals and a lovely red and golden center. Aside from the plants, Karina had a coffer in front of the bed. The coffer was one of those mimic creatures. Depending on his mood, the mimic would also turn into a toilet, a cabinet, a crib, a giant doll, a piano, a wagon wheel, or a bicycle. The mimic's favorite form was a wagon wheel. Tio Karina had met the mimic. He had spent 30 years as a wagon wheel traveling with a merchant. Whenever he blinked, he would freak people out. His true form the true form of the mimic was a doggish, like hairless face with, fa with the fangs of a shark and the round goat eyes and the body anatomy of a dog with the hands and feet wedged like a dog with a large sharp cloth. The skin was like that of a dolphin and he had little horns on his back and head. And when he introduced, he introduced himself to Karina, he said that his name was Vid, Vid Clad. What? Vid being called. V-I-N-D-K-A-L-D. 
I don't know how to pronounce that name, but I wrote it because I liked how it looked. <laughs> I, I remember that was for like due to a weird meaning that that word had, but I can't remember. But Vinkal opened and I and he looked about the room. He rolled his back legs a little. He said, "Right now, in the form of a coffer." Uh. He rose his peg a little, a little bit to see what Karina was up to. The lady was resting on the bed, staring at the roof. Indeed, the roof was quite pleasing to the eye. It had a one round light with delicate golden glow. The roof also featured a mural, the mural, a mural with with heads with wings. Each row was separated by a checkerboard pattern. In in one square there was the sun, and in the other white, and in the other was uh, in the other had black square. Each of the faces was stylized, but uh, they were individual enough for you to tell them apart. Eight time? Mm. Bro, time? Uh, eight minutes. Karina's face was somber, and she turned to the side. She signed, and then she sat up. <sighs> and then she sat up. Her feet searched for her stand. Vinka stretched his support leg, and he moved the sandals from under the bed. One of the fairies who had visited the other night had moved them. It was coming from fairies to other people's room and moved their items about. There have been a lot of fairies lately sent to the increased greenery in the city. Practically every balcony now had plants. Every day pedestrian, wa wa pedestrian walkways were shrunken to make room for more nature. Even the stately manors were increasing their garden size. This whole planting business was put in style by the demon king Marduk. When a king starts a civil project in his residence and on improvements in his residence, his citizens sometimes tend to want to imitate it. A breeze entered the bedroom, and with it came the scent of flowers. Karina stood up. She came to the window only wearing the sandals. She scented her white and pink cabbage roses. She noticed the cat by the balcony. She came to pet the little critter, but the cat shied away from her. She sighed again. Vigna opened his cuff her mouth and did a mimic of mimicry of Karina's sign. So she was like, ah, and then the mimic was like, ah. Smiling, Karina said, you're right. I should not allow Sava to claim me, lest I become like my brother. Vigna repeated, using Karina's voice, not like brother. Karina stood in the middle of the room, facing the mirror. She was thinking of what to wear, being that to remind her of her bath made a falling water sounds. Karina summoned for herself a tower, and then she went to the bathroom. After washing her mouth, she bathed using a nearby fountain. The fountain had water, water and when she felt herself cleansed from the filth, she entered the cold water in the center of the room. The bath was made of marble protruding from the ground. Since it was Ka since it was Karina who was bathing, the water did not have any smells. Karina could not tolerate other fisher scents or perfume. They tended to give her headaches. The bathroom was round and it had four different doors. One led to a small hallway with the other doors that led to the toilet toilets. There was one door which allowed the other occupants to enter and may and use the, and use the showers. Communal bathing was not a scene in Karina's home. Just when Karina was coming out of her bath, Mardu was coming inside with the baby. Mardu said, Good morning. Good morning to you as well, my brother, said Karina the party. Mardu smiled when he heard Karina's echo say, Good morning, brother. Karina's echo is like the mimic guy, the mimic, the mimic box she has in her room. Karina came to look at the baby. She took the little tiny feet and she petted the small little toes with the tiny nails. The baby Inara took the foot, took her foot and she began to suck it, as it is the habit of little small babies. Karina returned to her room wrapped in a large towel. She thought a moment and then finally she thought of the type of dress she wanted to wear for the first day as a teacher for her students. First impressions were important after all. Uh, time? Uh, six minutes. One had to start with the right foot forward. Karina summoned all, all of the fancy jewelry she had. She spotted the nicest wool dress with bodice made from golden silk. Around the waist she had a silk sash. The sleeves of her dress were bow built around. They got closer to the skin past the elbow. And on top of the dress she wore a red cape with golden patterns. Her lash mane was parted with two blue, with two blue ribbons. The dress had an off-the-shoulder neckline. The purpose of it was to highlight her wide, round necklace made of lapis lazuli and taffete. 
hanging from it there were a teardrop pearls and in the middle of the pearls there was a vessel with an opal. In the center of the necklace there was a pattern that resembled a dragonfly. Her bracelets were made of gold. In both hands she had 13 of them. Between both hands she had 13 of them. The sound of the cells had a normal shape with a strap with a strap and the sole in the full bed. The sole was made of silver with a golden bed. Its metallic nature made it very noisy whenever wherever Karina went. The strap was made of leather with an elaborate ornamentation to it. And on her face she wore a little pinky toe ring. Karina said to Ringla to Ringla, is there something missing? Something missing, answered the mimic using her voice. Karina said, and in the end, Karina Vingla uh, gestured to Karina. She came to stand before the ornamental copper surface. The surface changed to resemble a diadem. You know, one of, one of those little tiara-looking things. Karina asked, you don't think that it's a bit too much for Karina? When I think of diadems, I think of princesses. Not too much for Princess Karina, said Vinkla. Karina smiled blushing. In the end, she conceded that technically she was a princess of Aragorn, considering the fact that her brother was Marduk, the king. Karina, in the end, wore a diadem. The attire she spotted became the general's... Uh... Hmm. Alright, she wore the diadem. With the diadem added, Karina sighed and she headed out of the house. As she made her way towards the school, she stopped as if remembering something. Upon returning to Madrid's apartment, she found her breakfast waiting for her. When she had eaten, she started making her way back to school. It was then when she noticed the position of the sun. Class was about to start. Uh, time? Two minutes, 30 seconds. Using the crowd floor, Karina summoned herself to the entrance of the school. The students who saw her appear out of, out of thin air were not impressed in the slightest. Over the last couple of years, Madrid had made efforts to make magical appear something mundane. The locals were no longer afraid of it, or even impressed by it. It was just like any other game, akin to a dragon breathing fire. Many of the new magic users moving to Veraguero were not too pleased by this turn of events. They were used to they were used to people being impressed by their presence. The entrance to the school had ten guards. One of them told Karina, before allowed to enter, we, we will have to search your bag. Karina lifted her cape and she flapped her skirt about to show that she wasn't hiding anything. I haven't a bag or anything that concealed weapons on my person. Good. While you're inside, you will be required to wear this bracelet. It will suppress your magic, said the guard. Fine, I guess, said Karina, who did not have any magical powers to begin with. Other students in a non-magical school wore such bracelets. It was a preventive measure to keep magic people from bullying normal students. So some students and teachers wore the bracelet. Nobody knew who was the magic user among them. Like, uh, everyone had to wear whether they used magic or not. That way they couldn't, like, uh, you know, so they don't know who's magic. Any time? Hey, one minute, 30 seconds. The school was for the arts of peace. All the magic fell under the army's jurisdiction. John Mason used us to went to the military school to learn their craft. The school itself was around the, though the weaker mages went, went to the non magical school. The school itself was surrounded by a large brick fence. The entrance had ornamental iron bar doorway. The floor part of the school was shaped, uh, had the shape of a trefoil. The center of it was hollow with an internal garden in the middle. This allowed for other classes to have at least a couple of windows to see the outside. The entire building had two stories and the top hallway had a roof lantern and this allowed the hallway to be illuminated by natural light in the morning. The old design of the building had a golden and blue coloring with white accents. The first floor in the exterior was golden and the second a lovely shade of baby blue. Alright, we'll continue with these adventures later. Bye bye and God bless.